Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's, it's such an honor to, uh, to be here because, I, I mean, there are so many people here that just like knew me when I didn't know anything at all and were drawing the silliest letters. So, all right. So today I'm going to talk about a very exciting topic, which is generative typography. So what is actually going on underneath all the really fun visuals when you see it happening on the screen? And um, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Lynn, and with my partner Kevin Ye, we run the design studio Space Type. And we do all kinds of work that is letter form related. So both in the physical and digital realm, uh, we run a type foundry, we teach workshops, including here at Typographics, and we work on everything from the teeny tiniest logo type projects to giant wall murals. And I'm here to talk about the area of work that excites us the most right now, which is generative typography. To start with, I'll talk about how I found my way into the subject. My background is being a type designer, and before I started doing digital type, I was all about doing projects by hand. I thought I would never buy a, a, a bound journal. Uh, as when I was in high school, I was binding all my journals and sketchbooks. Um, and then later on, when I got to college, I was convinced that I was going to be uh, a printmaker for life. And then eventually, um, I was convinced that doing letter, you know, hand lettering and calligraphy, like that was going to be the path for me. And then one day I discovered type through Type at Cooper here and my life was changed. But I have to say though, that when I first started my job as a full-time type designer and I was making type day in and day out, there was this feeling that felt a little bit odd that I was making all these letters on the screen, just clicking around, moving the nodes, and, but I couldn't touch it. It seemed like such an intangible object and it almost felt like I was making things that weren't real in, you know, in my heart. Um, and so I wanted to figure out what was going on. Uh, what is happening inside all these .OTFs and .TTFs that I'm exporting every single day? I make so many of them, but I have no idea what to do with them. Of course, I can install it and type it out, of course, but uh, what is actually inside it. And I almost wish it would be a physical box that I could go into, open up, and then see what was inside. And so that was my motivation for learning how to code. I was like, I know nothing about programming. When I was going to college, I, I didn't take the, all these cool uh, coding classes that I know students these days are taking. Um, and so I finally got to that point where I was really figuring out how to talk to the computer, how computers understand letters, and then I found out that they really don't understand written communication in the way that we do as people. We recognize a letter A in all its various shapes and forms. We understand that this is an A regardless of it having a double story in a lowercase, or a single story, or sloped, or tall, or wide. We all know this. But a computer doesn't know because it really only knows the letter in the sense of this encoded little outline that lives in this thing called a font file. And that's a very limited way of looking at letters. So, when I set out to find ways to describe to the computer how I see letters, to maybe perhaps teach it to draw letters with me, um, I started looking around for inspiration. And you might find this surprising, but I actually find the most inspiration from artwork that was created before the digital age. So if you see this here, which is uh, art typing, or typewriter art as we know it today, we see that these are little pieces of metal type that were used to create this pattern upon the paper. And if you think about it back in the day, typewriters were not meant for art. Typewriters were meant for, bu for business correspondence, they were used for commercial purposes, and so for someone to have made artwork like this, they would have had to modify the typewriter, right? Like maybe the paper uh, should go sideways or a little bit sloped. Maybe it needs to go back in the machine to create these overlapped parts. Um, and so I think from this we may glean what it is like to teach the computer um, to draw letters in a way that we want it to draw. 
And then if we think about this work by Mary Ellen Solt, who was a very influential American concrete poet, um, we see all these layouts, and for us who are very fluent in the digital space, we might think, oh, like letters on a circle. We can do that with Illustrator. But for people in this time, they would have had to do this very, very consciously, meticulously, with a purpose. And so this sort of work inspires me in the sense that if I was Mary Ellen Solt, how would I have come up with this composition? After I came up with it, how would I have uh, composed this? Would I have used a grid? Would I have used a compass? Would I have calculated the amount of degree to rotate each letter before I actually did it? And here's work from Mirtha Dermasachi, who is just an amazing artist from Argentina. I know I'm just like gushing over all these artists, but I, it's just so close to my heart. And if you see this piece from the 70s, you can see that this piece is writing, but not in the sense that we use in everyday writing. So uh, this sort of falls into the realm of acemic writing, where it's unreadable writing. And so if we think about this, on the smallest scale, maybe we can think about this as strokes that are happening across the page, but it's very deliberate. There is a certain rhythm there, there is a certain sense of integrity, there's a certain sense of frequency and density, and so if you wanted to do this on the computer, how would we do it? Right? That requires a lot of intentional thinking that perhaps we take for granted. We sometimes, as artists and creatives, open up our sketchbook and we start doodling and we just take it for granted that uh, we can press on the, the paper and it creates a darker mark. Uh, and we don't even think about how amazing that is. So let's go back to thinking about the computer in its default state. So in its default state, the computer does not really know letters in that, the way that we do. So when a computer uh, out of the box um, thinks about letters, it just knows that it's this thing where there's a certain special font file and it just knows that if I type the letter A, oh, okay, this thing is in the 65th spot of this font file, and it just grabs it, right? So that's very limiting. So what could we do if we could teach the computer and communicate and really collaborate in the ways that we look at letters, draw letters? Um, I mean, I don't know. There's so many possibilities, right? So as a very simple example, let's think about this example. If you were thinking about describing the letter A to someone who has never seen it before, who has no context of the Latin alphabet, how would you describe it? And let's just imagine you're like talking to them over the phone. You might say, hey, grab a grid paper, and then I'll tell you which uh, squares to color in. So on the first row, you might say, hey, the first row, don't fill anything in. Go to the second row. Go to the fifth one and the sixth one. Color those in leave those blank, and in the third line, and so on and so forth. So there's like a very slow process of telling someone on pixels, off pixels, sort of, like how, an, how a fax machine would work. And then in another way, perhaps you could describe it like a series of directions or coordinates. So perhaps you could say, hey, well, start from this point over here, take, take however many steps to the north side, take however many steps to the right side, put a point, and then go to this other direction, put a point, and then put it all together, right? So this is, uh, on very basic terms, this is how something like, a, uh, something like an SVG file might work, where there is a sense of coordinates. Like an Illustrator file, you might find yourself doing the same thing with a pen tool. And so after you've established this common ground, after you have some sense of foundation to explain to the computer how you're looking at the letter, we can do lots of things by building upon this concept. So from the grid paper example from before, let's imagine that we go and say, hey, all those squares that you filled out, let's draw a letter A on top. And then we can do many more things, right? We can chain ideas and concepts. We can say, hey, what if they all fall down like marbles? Or, what if they all fly away like birds? How would we describe a bird flying off in the air, right? Like all these things we have to think about. And so with coordinates, maybe we could say, hey, you know everything that I told you before? Just uh, scale everything down by 50% uh, on the horizontal axis. 
or the vertical axis. And then so we could perhaps ask the computer to stretch our letters. And so with all this in mind, I'm going to show you a series of sketches that I did with my own typeface called ampersandist. So uh, I'll take you through some sketches that I was doing day by day. So here are very early sketches of uh, the examples that I was doing with ampersandist. My goal was very simple from the start. I told myself that I'll do something new every day and just take a couple of hours out of my time and let's see where I go. And so this is like the very early aughts where um, I was trying to figure out, okay, like let's move lines so A turns into a B and so on and so forth. Um, and then the next time, and then the next day I did it, it was a little bit smoother. I could get it a little bit more stylized, right? So you can see the, le the letter shapes that are forming. And then the next day I figured, well, I figured out how to do it when it's just one letter. Why don't I just duplicate it and arrange them on a grid? So here you can see, uh, a grid of three by three letters, and they're all turning into different letters. And just keep in mind that like, for letters like the B to turn into the letter C in the capital form, that's different uh, numbers of outlines, right? So you can see the counters of the B ever quickly, like they enlarge to make three Cs. Um, and so after that, I figured, okay, maybe I just put this on a pixel grid and ask the computer to have it on or off, depending on what it sees in the background. And so here we have a couple of pixel RE backgrounds. And then I figured out, OK, like how do I do a gradient? How fun could that be? And then I figured, OK, so I made this grid. Why don't I animate the grid? So this is a, a, a genre of exploration um, tied to cellular automata where we try to emulate things that happen uh, to cells. And so you can see it's almost like a a mold that is growing in the background. Um, and so that was really fun to figure out. And so here we have another example where I was thinking about how we extrapolate sh uh, shapes in all these vector design programs. And I was like, how, how, could I do that with code? What could I do with it? And so I, I tried to figure that out. And even the most basic things that we're just so used to and take for granted because we can do it in like any editing software that we have with the click of a button, um, I just appreciate uh, what uh, everyone had to go through in order to make that functionality. And so here we have another example where it seems complicated, but it's actually the same example as the, uh, as the grid example, as the pixelated example. It's the same thing, except every single pixel has an animated square, and they all overlap. So it looks as if it's, everything is moving because it knows where its place is, but it's actually simple when you sort of look under the hood. And then this is an example where uh, perhaps I got a little bit silly. You can't really do the same thing and be, um, have amazing projects day after day. So sometimes I got weird glitchy projects such as these. And sometimes I was like, I'm, I'm tired of looking at big letters. I'll just do something fun and make ripples. Um, here's another one. This is a happy accident, actually. So this is, oh, this is a piece of work that incorporates a library called uh, Matter. Um, and so with this, I assigned all the outlines some sense of physicality. And like, they are like a jar of marbles that start to fall apart, but they all are connected by a rubber band. So they tend to make this weird, funky little outline. Completely accidental, but lots of fun. And then here's an example that might happen if you photocopied a letter and then shredded it through the paper uh, shredder, put it back together, copied it again, and then did the same thing over and over. Um, so thankfully, the computer is very generous with doing repetitive tasks. So this was a fun one. And here is one where I was trying to emulate a water ripple, put that on a video of what I had already done before, and see what could happen. And then this is one where I was just very, very inspired by everything that's happening in nature. Uh, there's actually a really great series called The Nature of Code by Dan Schiffman. Uh, I highly recommend it um, anyhow. So this is using an algorithm uh, that uh, senses where it could go, and it doesn't invade someone else's space, just like tree roots would, for example. So we can see these uh, dots sort of uh, spreading out into the space, but not quite intruding upon their neighbors. 
And then, of course, there's uh, selfies are a whole genre that we never really escape, right? So <laughs> here we have a letter selfie. Um, and then here is another example where I was using um, I was using physics libraries to emulate letters that were falling down. And then I figured that, well, I already have this, I might as well make something new with it. And then on the right side that you see that I was trying to emulate a, um, emulate a, a VCR effect. I think, I think I got an ad for it and I was like, I can make that myself. And then here we have another example of the same mold growing idea, but a little bit uh, more sandy and more grainy, let's say. And then here we have an example of where I was like, okay, what can't you do with letters? You're not supposed to stretch letters. Stretch letters are terrible as a type designer. It's like our worst nightmare. And I figured, well, I can do it to my type, so why not? So here we have all this stretch type that just stretches all the time. Um, and then we have some more 3D-esque examples. They're not quite 3D, actually. There's a lot of things that we can do with math. Um, all these math algorithms and uh, formulas that I used to ignore as a high school student really biting me um, and coming back. And now I know, like, oh, like sine functions, cosines. If I had known how much I would love them, um, I, I really wish I could go back in time and be like, pay attention. You will need trigonometry later on in life. Yeah. And, and so keep in mind that there's a lot of failed sketches in between all of them. Um, and so here's a, an example, the very first idea that I tried where I think I was trying to turn the A into a B and then it melted and I couldn't figure out why. And, and then sometimes like, I could scrap that. Um, the next time it worked out, but um, you know, fun times. So here's an A through Z in case you're craving to see something beyond the letter J. Um, and so, all these sketches that you see were made with p5.js. That being said, I will say that us at Space Type are very framework agnostic. We're framework agnostic, we're programming language agnostic. Um, both of us combined, we use uh, JavaScript, Python, uh, C++, like Rust. We use so many different languages. And I just want to tell you that if you're thinking about uh, learning all of this and starting out, which, whichever framework or language doesn't really matter. Um, what really matters is that you think about how to communicate with the computer, and you think about how to communicate your idea, because it's not really the technology that is going to make the things happen. It really is just the, uh, the really human thinking. So I really want to encourage you to think about coding as not this like alien thing that comes pre-packaged and you can download it and it's this foreign thing. It's just an extension, just like you would have a different calligraphy tool or you might just pick up like this like very special set of inks and brushes. So yes, that is what I would like to encourage all of you. All right. And so you might be wondering though, what can you do with all of this? Like, okay, Lynn, like this is all cool and we see things that are moving, but what can we do? Um, and so this is a sneak peek of the website that we made for Existential Co., which is an LA production company. We made this in collaboration with our friends at PAX Studio. Um, and you can see that this is a website that encourages people to interact with it. We can see type that is moving. Um, the whole idea is that everything in the end turns to dust. So you can, uh, so as you were seeing before, you can land on the site, you can interact with it. Um, it's not online yet, so this is a sneak preview. Um, and at the end of the day, at the end of the, uh, the process, you can, of course, download it because we all want to share our big ideas. So, um, so here we have some ideas that you might have. And, it, you know, everything, as, as artists and creatives living in a capitalist society, we have to, we have to make work out of it somehow. Uh, but we can make the process fun. So here we have the, uh, the debugging screen, let's say, for uh, the website. So you can see that this was a staging site that we had where we were using different methods, different kinds of animation formats. Sometimes the, uh, the dust uh, ASCII letters were loaded in, as, loaded in as images, sometimes as text, and you can see how they behave differently. And all of this was live, of course, so it's very nice to be able to share a sketch really fast with your clients, your collaborators, and you can all test it out at the same time. And for me, that is really the boon of uh, generative typography. This is a project that is very fresh. So this was 
a very fun project where I was commissioned to make typographic animation for a campaign that was coming out in Japan for Panasonic. So they had this slogan called Make New, and so it's, it's everyone's dream to be just given a budget and a very brief uh, brief, and then say, oh, okay, you can make whatever you want. So here we have Make New, um, and then it was just animated in multiple ways that I wanted it to be animated. And I'll just show you a 30-second clip that's running in Japan, and it uses artwork from many different artists. So you'll see many people in there. It's so cool. <laughs> that I can't see that on TV. <laughs> um, all right, so this is the last project that I will leave you with. This is one of the newest projects that we are running here at SpaceType. Uh, Kevin is the one who is leading up about it. I know Kevin had a presentation yesterday at Type Lab. You can ask him all about it if you see him. Um, so this is a website that we're making for all of you, the community. So this is a website where you can animate your variable fonts with preloaded animation. You can upload your own variable font if you want to. There are also pre, uh, uh, variable fonts on here that are preloaded if you just want to check out what it's happening. Um, and so here we have Beatrice's Ancho as our guinea pig. And you can see that it's just animating. Uh, it's just animating for you. You don't need to do anything special, but you can customize. Uh, what is happening within the animation with all these sliders. So all these sliders are parameters that is already inside the variable font. So uh, you're uh, exploring the design space that the type designer has given you already. And we're adding little functionalities all the time as we, as we speak. Um, so here we can see that uh, we can type in your custom text. Here we have uh, another sketch where you can see um, different kinds of animation. And they behave in different ways also. So you can see that sometimes um, uh, sometimes you can interact it with a mouse. Sometimes you can interact by the keyboard. It's a little bit different each time. But check it out. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>